Well, for those of you who are visiting with us tonight, my name is David Platt. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here, and uh, I just want to personally add my welcome to you on this Christmas Eve. I was thinking earlier today about uh, all the decisions that we all make around Christmas, like what gift to get for this family member or friend, uh, whether well, what to do on Christmas Eve, what to do on Christmas Day, whether or not to travel, whether or not to travel to his family, her family, neither family, both families together. How do you make it all work? And I, I thought about one particular decision I remember making as a kid on Christmas Eve. So I uh, had an older brother, about two years older than me. We were really young at this point. And, uh, you know, Christmas Eve... We would always go to bed and then get up really early on Christmas morning, like four o'clock in the morning early, and wake our parents up, be like, hey, let's go see, uh, you know, what, what's down in the, the room, in the living room. And so uh, that was kind of our custom. Well, there was this one particular year when we had tons of people in the house, all the grandparents were there, aunts, uncles, cousins, so the house was packed full, which meant I was kicked out of my bed, as was my brother, so we're sleeping on sleeping bags in my parents' room, I'm, so I'm getting tucked into my Spider-Man sleeping bag there, and uh, I remember my mom kind of got down uh, eye level with us, and she said, all right, boys, there's a lot of people in the house, you cannot get up at four o'clock in the morning, like, it's, it's not going to work this year, and... Uh, and so, and she could tell we were about to just kind of react to that, not very positively. And she said, listen, under no circumstance, unless it is a life or death situation, you stay in this sleeping bag until I come to get you in the morning. It'll be like eight o'clock or so. And we're like, no way. And she said, listen, if you, unless it's a life or death situation, if you get up out of the sleeping bag, you may not get any presents. So that was like, laid it down. All right, I'm in Spider-Man. I'm not moving. So, so, uh, so I laid there, and so she tucks us in, and I'm laying there, and it's one of those nights you're so excited, you, you can't get to sleep, so you're just up for a while. And uh, while I'm laying there, after a while, it hits me. I need to use the restroom. And so in my little mind at that moment, I've got a, I got a problem. Because my mom has just told me, unless it is life or death, I am supposed to stay in the sleeping bag. If I get up out of the sleeping bag, it's not life or death, I may not get any presents. So I start thinking, what, what do I do? And basically, I, I've got two options. Uh, <laughs> option number one is to, uh, as quietly as possible, sneak out of that sleeping bag and go to the restroom and as quietly as possible come back just hoping that nobody hears me and my presence are not in jeopardy. So that's option number one. I trust you realize what option number two is. <laughs> it's a bit warmer option. <laughs> anyway, sorry, sorry, but that's that, you know option number two. So, uh, so I'm laying there and in my little mind, like I'm just going back and forth like, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? So I try to prolong it as long as I possibly can, but obviously there comes a point where that's not possible anymore. And so let me pause for a second in the story at this point, and I want to take a little poll. So I want to ask you honestly, not your older, wiser, mature self, however you older, wiser, mature you are now, but picture yourself as a kid in that circumstance. Be honest. What would you do? So if you would take the risk Get out of the sleeping bag and use the restroom. Raise your hand if you would take option number one. Whatever, all right? So, so, all right, if you would say, I would not take the risk, I'd go option number two. How many of you? All right, we got some takers. <laughs> and the people sitting next to them are not, just a lot less comfortable right now. <laughs> just know the facilities are available whenever you need them. Like nobody's, nobody's threatening you anywhere right now. So, uh, so here's what I did. I, I, was, I was laying there holding as long as I possibly could. And when it came time to make the decision, I just let it flow right there in <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> My mom 
She comes to wake me up this morning, the next morning. She's like, what happened? I said, like, I don't know. I'm going to get my presents. <laughs> uh, I, so I joke about decisions, but in this moment, I would like to bring us face to face with the ultimate decision that Christmas confronts us with. A decision that is far more serious and more significant than any other decision I submit you will ever make in your life. Like what if Christmas is not just the celebration of a holiday? What if Christmas is a confrontation of our hearts with a question? So these guys just sang about angels singing on high one night 2,000 years ago. And the announcement from the angels was clear. I'll put it up here on the screen, Luke 2, 2, verse 11. It's very simple. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And in that simple verse, I want you to hear two realities that Christmas confronts us with about Christ. For unto you is born this day a Savior. He is a Savior, which implies we need one. So Christmas is an announcement that you and I need someone to save us, specifically to save us from our sin. Christmas is an announcement that every one of us in this room right now, from the youngest child to the oldest adult, has sinned against God. It's part of the fallen human condition. We all turn aside from God's ways to our ways. We all think we have a better way. So we sin, all of us. And our sin separates us from God. And if we die in our sin, separated from God, as simply and as sobering as I can put it, we spend eternity separated from God. But Christmas is an announcement that a Savior has been born. God himself has come to us in Jesus. He has come to live the life we could not live, a life with no sin. And then even though he had no sin to pay a price for, even though he did not deserve to die, Jesus died on a cross for our sin. Jesus died to pay the price for you and for me. And then the good news keeps getting better because he didn't stay dead for long. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, defeating death. And now salvation from sin and death is possible for anyone and everyone through faith in him as Savior. Through faith, not through works. There's no amount of work we can do to save us from our sin. That would make us the Savior. And this is not meet in the middle. He goes halfway, we go halfway. I talked to many people. I was having a conversation just the other day. Many people who call themselves Christians but believe they need to work in order to get to heaven. I asked this man the other day, do you know for sure that you will spend eternity in heaven when you die? And he said, I hope so. I go to church, I pray, I do good things. And I said to him, none of those things will get you to heaven. The only way you can know you're going to heaven is if you are trusting 100% in Jesus as your savior, as the only one who can save you from your sin. You cannot save yourself, which goes totally against the way we are wired. We think certainly there's something I need to do, like I can do this. Religions of the world are actually built on this instinct in us. I remember talking one day with two men in another country who were actually, so they were of different religions and we were sitting outside a temple where one of them worshiped. And we were having this conversation and during the conversation, they basically were saying that we all essentially believe the same thing that all religions are fundamentally the same, just superficially different. And we may give things different labels, but in the end, we're all one. We believe the same thing. So 
I sat there listening for a while and then finally I spoke up and I said, it's almost like you guys picture God or whatever you want to call him at the top of a mountain and we're all at the bottom of a mountain and you may take this path up and I may take this path up, but in the end, we'll all be in the same place. And they smiled, they said, exactly, you understand. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, what if I told you that the God of the top of the mountain didn't wait for us to come up to him? What if he actually came down to us where we are? They said, that would be great. I said, that is the difference. What we celebrate at Christmas is the reality that God is not waiting for us to find a way to him. God has come to us. He is, he has come to save us from our sins. So Christmas is a shot across the bow of all of our pride. For Christmas declares to every one of us that none of us can save ourselves. We need a savior. And he has come. A savior who Luke 2, 11 continues is Christ the Lord. So Christmas is a confrontation with Christ who is Savior and Lord. The title Lord there has dual meaning. In the Jewish mind, this title was equated with only one person, God. God alone is Lord. So for Jewish readers, for Christ to be Lord would have been clearly been understood to mean that Christ was God in the flesh. Then for Gentile readers, that word in the Greek, kyrios, would have been used in common language in the first century to refer to a ruler or a master or a king. It represented someone with absolute authority over another. So Christmas confronts us with the reality that Jesus is not just the Savior who will deliver us from the penalty of sin. He is also the Lord who reigns with dominion over our lives. Again, I talk to various people who call themselves Christians who say, I've accepted Jesus as my savior, but I've not really surrendered my life to Jesus as my Lord. And some may not say it out loud that way, but many will live like it. Ask someone if they're a Christian, if they believe in Jesus as savior, and they will say, yes, absolutely. But then look at their lives and ask, are they following Jesus as Lord? And the answer will not be so clear. We, and especially in contemporary Christianity, in our culture, try to separate Jesus as Savior from Jesus as Lord. Create a whole picture where we make a decision, say a prayer, sign a card, go through some sort of religious ritual accepting Jesus as our Savior only to live for ourselves, for our pleasures, for our preferences as Lord of our lives. The Bible knows nothing of this disconnect though. If anything, it's actually weighted the other way. In the book of Acts, the story of the earliest Christians, Jesus is referred to as Lord 92 times. He is referred to as Savior twice. And so the Bible and Christmas confront us with a reality. Christ is the Savior and the Lord, and it is not possible to use him as Savior if you refuse him as Lord. You cannot use Jesus as Savior while you refuse Jesus as Lord. He is both. It's who he is. When you think about it, this is both simple and Serious. Jesus is the Lord over all creation. God in the flesh. The one who we celebrate his birth has been God from the beginning. Did you know that today, Christmas Eve 2018, marks the 50 year anniversary of man's first journey to the moon? So Apollo 8 launched on December 21st, 1968. And that Christmas Eve in what was at that time the most watched and listened to broadcast of all time, three astronauts sent back this message. Watch this with me.
who did that? Do you realize who caused the planets to come into existence? Christ, God, the Lord, the same one who caused you to come into existence, the same one who is sustaining your heart beating at this moment. He is the Lord. He is the God who reigns over us, which means then Christmas confronts us with a very personal decision, confronts us face to face with a question, like right now. And the question is not, have you accepted Jesus, whatever that may mean, or even do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the Christmas message that Christ has come? Like, ladies and gentlemen, demons believe that. Demons believe in Jesus. They believe that Christ the Savior has come. The question is not, do you believe that Jesus is the Savior? The question is, have you bowed your knee to Jesus as Lord? This is the question that doesn't just confront us at Christmas. It determines our Eternity. The Bible goes on to say that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every one of us in this room, every single one of us from the poorest to the richest, the wisest, the smartest, the kindest, like every one of us, will one day bow and call Jesus Lord? That is not a question. The question is, will we bow now or will we bow when it is too late? So please hear me tonight. Don't hear me. Hear God through angels 2,000 years ago and his word right now. Unto you is born the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Today, you, tonight, like right here, you can be saved from all your sins by bowing your knee to Jesus as the Lord. Romans 10, 9, I'll put it up here. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the greatest news in all the world. You can be saved from all your sins and experience eternal life under the loving lordship of the Christ who created you, who knows so much better than you do what is best for your life. So I urge you, I urge you, do not toy with 
Christ at Christmas. Do not trifle with Jesus in your life. Do not settle for patronizing religious games before him. He is the Lord and Savior who is worthy of all worship. And every one of us in this room has two choices. You can turn from Jesus in your life or you can trust in Jesus as your Lord. But there is no in-between. This is the ultimate decision that Christmas confronts all of us with and it is far more serious and far more significant than any other decision you will ever make in this life. Christmas is not just a celebration of a holiday. It is a confrontation of our hearts with Christ. So how will you respond to him? Will you turn from Jesus in your life? Or will you, right where you're sitting, trust in Jesus as your Lord? And I want to invite you on this Christmas Eve to trust in Jesus as your Lord. And know that when you do, that God forgives you of all of your sin not based on anything you have done or can do in the future, based on your trust in his love for you. As you trust in Jesus as Savior and the loving Lord of your life, I guarantee you there is no better way to live than under the authority of the one who loves you infinitely and knows infinitely more than you what is best for your life. So, in this moment, here's what I want to invite us to do. These guys are going to come back up and, and sing a song they've actually written based on Luke chapter 2. And while they're singing, I want to invite you to reflect on that question, to answer that question in your life. Uh, I want to invite you while they're singing, if you have never trusted in Jesus as Lord, if you are not following Jesus as Lord, I want to invite you in these moments just to pray and say, God, I need you to save me from my sins. I want to trust in Jesus as my Lord. I invite you to do that right where you're sitting and know that as you pray that to God, Romans 10 it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Like, what better way to spend Christmas Eve than experiencing Christ as Savior and Lord of your life? Don't miss this. For those of you who have trusted in Jesus as Lord, just to spend the next few moments, or so we're so busy doing so many different things this time of year, just to pause and reflect on what it means to know Him as Savior and Lord, your Savior, your Lord. And while we're reflecting, I wanna, I wanna ask you to do something tangible. So hopefully when you came in tonight, you received a bulletin uh, that just says Advent on the front and on the back there is a response card. And I wanna ask you to do this, like even if you've been a member of McLean Bible Church for 50 years, I wanna invite everybody who has one of these to fill out whatever information you feel comfortable filling out on the back there, even if it's just your first name. I mean, certainly any more we wanna honor and respect, but even if you just put your first name at the top, and then there's a, a place where you can say, I am following Jesus as Lord, or I, want, I would like to find out more information about what it means to follow Jesus, or. And then there's, there's even a couple lines just to put, I have a question or a prayer request. Like one of the things we prioritize as a church is praying for each other. So I'm sure everybody who has a bulletin at least has something that you would say, I would love for somebody to pray for this in my life or my family. And so during these few moments as you reflect and pray, I wanna invite you to fill out that and then after they've sung this song, we'll have a time where we can turn these response cards in. So let me invite you to do that while you pray and reflect. So here, let me, let me pray for us and lead into this song.
Oh God, you know how I have prayed for this moment. God, please open eyes to see Jesus as Savior and Lord. Deliver us, we pray, from trifling, toying with Jesus this time of year. God, please, in these few moments, help us to reflect, to pray, and I pray especially for those who do not, have come here tonight not knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord. God, I pray that that would change even in the next few moments as people all across this room pray. So please lead this time by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.